Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a review of the next installment in Naxos's ongoing remastering and repackaging and release of the Vox catalog. And this is a particularly inspired selection, in my view. It is Tchaikovsky, Symphony No. 4, and Romeo and Juliet with the Utah Symphony under Maurice Abravanel. I mean, it's kind of funny because back in the day, you would say, oh, Utah Symphony, who wants Utah Symphony, right? I mean, never one of the world's great orchestras. Abravanel was a very good conductor, but, you know, not a stellar name. And you had all the, the hot shots. This was from 1974. You had Carrion in Berlin. You had Bernstein in New York Phil. You had the, the up-and-coming hot shots. You had Schulte and you had... You know, a Bado was running around doing stuff. It, it, really, it's kind of fascinating to me. But this disc is an exemplar of a period, of a time. It was a time when, first of all, everybody did Tchaikovsky. And because so many people did Tchaikovsky, so many people did it really well. Nowadays, things are very different. Nowadays, Tchaikovsky performances tend to come in two flavors. They are either boring... I mean, just plain boring, nothing happening. You wonder why they bother. Or embarrassed. And the embarrassed versions are sometimes kind of more interesting because it manifests itself, the embarrassment, the shame, in Tchaikovsky needing help, needing help in all kinds of ways. You diddle the orchestration, you mess with the tempos, you, 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 you engage in all kinds of micromanagement, nagogic mannerisms and things to try and sell the product. Well, in 1974, nobody needed to sell the product. And performances, well, there were some better, there were some worse. There were always conductors who tinkered with the text. I mean, forget Leopold Stokowski. He was a law unto himself. But, you know, other conductors did it too. I mean, even Bernstein did add cymbal crashes in the finale of the fourth. It, it, they did it. But they did it within the context of an idiomatic understanding of what the music was all about and how to play it. And nowadays, that seems to have gone. That shameless romanticism is, isn't something that most conductors have a grip on. And so hearing this, I thought was really came, I mean, listening to it again, as, as something really refreshing, because this was not a Tchaikovsky cycle that anybody was particularly hysterically enthusiastic about, because there were lots of them. I mean, there was Marcel with Vienna, there was Uben Meda, there was, you know, Markevich and the LSO, and zillions of performances of the individual works. But here we have a conductor who was a very, very fine conductor. Um, he was a modern conductor. You know, he was made his career doing, you know, court viol and that kind of stuff in the 20s and 30s, you know, cabaret music and whatnot. He wasn't a dyed-in-the-wool romantic, and the Utah Symphony was never one of the great orchestras, but they just got Tchaikovsky. They knew it. They knew how to play it. They knew what it was supposed to sound like. These are fresh. I mean, this, this, it says here in the back that they are fresh and direct interpretations. Fresh, definitely. They're lively and they always move and the climaxes happen where they're supposed to happen. There's some very fine playing in the finale by the strings and whatnot. I mean, a prophet all really gets them to play. And then there's, uh, and then they are direct. He doesn't feel the need to monkey with it, but he knows where the music is going. One of my one of my linchpin moments is the recapitulation in the first movement of the fourth. You know, when it's after it's da 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 faux timpani crescendo before that moment is like this and then the main theme comes in and the timpani crescendo invariably drowns out the main theme you know it, 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 the climax is the arrival of the theme it's the tune that matters not the noise before the tune but a lot of Tchaikovsky conductors these days don't seem to get that and I find that rather fascinating I really do because it's so unnecessary Tchaikovsky knew what the high point was, and what he needs is violins that'll just fling themselves into the music, like Eugene Ormandy in Philly, or Carrion in Berlin, or one of those people. You know, they had amazing string sections. Well, they don't have an amazing string section. 
but they understand where the climax is. And that really tells you something. The slow movement is sweet and songful. He, he, Bravinel doesn't need to make a meal out of it. I mean, it's marked, you know, Andante in modo di canzona, like a song, and that's exactly what it is. The scherzo, well, there was a tendency always at back of the day to try to play it really fast. This is not, but this is clean. It's clear. You hear the melodies. You get the piquancy of Tchaikovsky's amazing timbral sensitivity. And the finale's terrific. It's not, it's not you know, crazy like Mravinsky. You know, I mean, they, they're, you're not dealing with Leningrad here. But it, it, it has all of the necessary excitement and parade ground festivity. Romeo and Juliet is beautifully shaped. The fight scenes are vivid. The love music is is passionate and songful. I mean, it's the way Tchaikovsky, or one of the ways, let's put it that way, that Tchaikovsky ought to go. The remastering sounds very, very good. I mean, there's a little bit of sibilance in the high frequencies. You can hear it on the cymbal crashes. It makes it actually sound extremely present and vivid in my view. Some people may find it a little bit annoying. It just is wonderful to go back and hear a performance that doesn't make any apologies for the music. It's really, really great for that reason. I mean, in context, there will be better Tchaikovsky 4s, of course, and better Romeos and Juliets and all that. There are. Yes, there are. But these are very, very, very good. And more to the point, they're idiomatic and, and, and natural sounding. And that's worth a lot in this music, especially today. So if you haven't heard these performances, uh, they're worth hearing. They're definitely worth hearing. It's fun to hear what a second tier, in those days, second tier was really second tier. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, with, of the normal quality we're used to. Making them play a conductor who just knows his stuff um, in very, very good sonics. You know, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.